I've heard the running down the hall screaming. It's usually after I present, though. It's, it's not uh, doing that. It's a great honor to be here with you guys. The uh, reason it didn't take me long uh, is that it was the counselors, the people at the front line, the people that really are out there asked to do so much in our school systems, no matter what part of the country you're in. Uh, and I couldn't turn that down. We knew also the legislation was moving at that time. Uh, and I thought, what better, uh, either to come here and celebrate or come here and complain. Uh, so, but we get to celebrate. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor. I've got to meet so many good people. We're starting to work with, we work with coaches a lot. Coach Snyder is helping us. So I got to stop by and see the campus yesterday. A beautiful campus. Uh, got to spend some time last night. Uh, I got to go out to eat. I, I went to a really unique local place, uh, Chili's. <laughs> And the people are so nice there. They kept coming back wanting me to repeat my order. You guys have such great accents. <laughs> you know, you know, fantastic. I'm here today, though, to, to share a little bit about the silent epidemic of youth suicide. We're going to talk about the stats. We're going to talk about the impact. Some of this you guys know and are very aware of. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some of the things that we can do together to work toward that. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about the Jason uh, Foundation. Uh, let me begin by saying that there's a lot of great organizations. We've been blessed to be uh, one of the national leaders, but there's other good national organizations. There are other good, great local, what we call mom and pop organizations throughout the nation. So by far, as you listen to all of this, uh, we are not the, uh, the, the captain of the team. We're just one of the members uh, there to be able to work with so many other fine organizations that are out there uh, trying to confront this silent epidemic of youth suicide. You know, when you start out by calling it a silent epidemic, you know, if we look at it, each generation that we've had uh, over the, the last several decades seems to have a, a silent epidemic uh, a tied to it. In the 1960s, now, and I could have just read about some of this stuff, don't be dating me at these times. Uh, in the 1960s, it seemed that teen pregnancy uh, was, was the silent epidemic. Uh, you know, if a, if a girl became pregnant when I was in high school, she just disappeared. I mean, there wasn't any child care. There wasn't any work with the counselor situation. On Friday, she was at school. And on, on come Monday morning, her locker was cleaned out and she was gone. If anything was said about her, it was that she had gone to live with her aunt or her grandmother. That's all you ever heard. In, in, my, in those younger years also, I can remember, and this is in Tennessee, I'm not sure it was happening here in Kansas, but in Tennessee, when a teacher became pregnant, when she started to show, she had two choices. If she was tenured, she could take a leave of absence. If she wasn't tenured, she had to resign her job and hope that it was there after the pregnancy, after the birth. Now, the reason we did this was that we felt like if young people never saw the results of sex, they would never think about it. <laughs> it didn't work real well, did it? Well, only when we found out that educating and, and providing that information and educating our young people, we could turn it around. And that's what we did. Uh, in 2010, we had the lowest birth rate since uh, 1946. So education worked with that and still working, even though it's still a challenge. In the 80s, we turned to alcohol and drugs was sort of the silent epidemic that came into play. Uh, the 80s were called the cocaine 80s. And for those of you that were around uh, coming up through that time, uh, really the crack cocaine started coming into to existence and the marijuana became, became its rise uh, going on to it uh, and, and was really making an impact in our society at that time. But in the mid 90s, until today, Another silent epidemic, as we've dubbed it, came into play. That was a silent epidemic of youth suicide. Now, some of my colleagues, we work on the National Council of Suicide Prevention. We work with some other national organizations. They disagree with us using the word epidemic. Uh, I, I, I'm a little bit of an old country boy. I don't understand why we wouldn't call it that. In fact, I believe after you see the following slides and the statistics, you'll understand why we call it that silent epidemic. It is something that is unfortunately touching every state, every community, every area of our country with no matter to gender or socioeconomic type of status. And it's touching us at a ravaging rate. And we'll look at that. But to start with it, 
uh, this silent epidemic touched my family. Uh, I came out of uh, uh, Vanderbilt University with a master's degree in theology, counseling, education. Uh, went into church work uh, doing counseling. We have any marriage counselors out there on the side? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I went doing it on a sliding scale, and that was something. Uh, in Tennessee at that time, they had a, a law that before you could get a divorce that you had to have an hour of counseling. Uh, so what all these people did over all these years to get where they were, I had to turn around in 50 minutes. Uh, and that was kind of a frustrating job. Uh, so I left that and saw my true calling was entrepreneurship. Uh, you'll notice by the end of my, my talk, I don't ever claim to be the sharpest tack in the box, but I do have a great talent. I can surround myself with good people. Uh, that's what I did when I went out and I started an insurance company from scratch. Uh, and uh, my right arm person at that insurance company is, is now, to show you my ethics, when I sold it, I went back and stole t two best employees and brought them to the Jason Foundation. And one of those is here today. Uh, and afterwards, if there's questions, I'll be glad to talk to you. But also we have our CEO, uh, Michelle Ray. She's over in the corner. You might want to stand up so they can tell who you are. Uh, she's our CEO. She does all the hard work. I was president and CEO for 15 years till I figured out CEO did all the work. And we split it. And I gave her CEO and I took president. So, so that was it. You know, I wish I could say that I started the Jason Foundation because I love kids. You're out there. You're doing what you do because you really have that passion for young people. That's why I'm so grateful for you guys. Mine, for 23 years, I ran an insurance company. Uh, I surrounded myself and built it, built it from scratch, and really came to what I call the, the great American upper middle income class family. Uh, the boat uh, at the dock and the, the marina and, and the house overlooking the lake, the cars, the sports cars. Uh, I had a, a, a great dog, a, a cat that was questionable. <laughs> uh, two fine boys. Life, family, everything was, was great till July the 16th, 1997. July the 16th, 1997, I arrived home to found that my youngest son, Jason, had written two notes, put them down in front of himself, stood in front of his bed, placed my 38 caliber behind his right ear, and he pulled the trigger. He thought that he would fall directly back on his bed, but the force of a 38 snub-nosed dum-dum coming out of the left side of his head was so forceful that it spun him completely around and he had fallen across the threshold of his bedroom door. So as I came in looking for him that day, not out of, just wanted to see him, wanted to see if he wanted to go out and have a Coke, I walked into his room and fell over my son's body. I wish I could tell you that I got up at that time and started the Jason Foundation and tell you that, hey, we're going to confront this terrible thing called youth suicide. Uh, but it wasn't until October 1st that we actually started in September uh, before we decided to do the Jason Foundation. You see, as a parent, much like many of you guys that are parents, I had gone to every PTO, every PTA, every church program. Uh, that would provide information to, for me to raise my two boys the best I could and the safest I could. I went to ones about uh, drugs and alcohol and bullying, even a form of bullying in, back in there. That's, this is not new people. This, is, this has been around. It's just new ways we're doing it now, new ways we're doing it. I, I remember one particular, the things we do for our young people, and I won't say what county because I've talked to some people here that have been, have roots in Tennessee, so I can't spread too many rumors. Uh, I remember one I went to at a, at a, at a it was a PTA. And these, the sheriff came out with the, with the showing us the, the drugs. Have you ever seen those where they open those little big suitcases and pull out all the little drugs and put them down with, with names by them? The thing, thing was to, to see the drugs and be able to identify them. That way if we found them in our son's or daughter's pockets or they fell out and we were putting them in the washer, if we saw those things, we knew that our sons and daughters were, were starting maybe to, to experiment with drugs. So the sheriff's job was to show us what to be looking for. Now, this is in the, uh, the, the late 70s, early, early 80s. Sheriff came out and said, okay, people, there's one terrible drug out there. And please, I'm not, don't take this lightly. I'm not being funny on this. It 
he said, you got to be able to recognize. How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you know what marijuana smells like? Well, we wasn't in Colorado, and he was a sheriff. We wasn't going to raise our hand that we knew what it smelled like. You know, I just graduated from Vanderbilt. If you went down in the library and been at the bottom, you got high just studying down there. Uh, so we didn't raise our hand. He took that as a challenge. He said, you got to know what it smells like. If your kids come home with it on their clothes, you've got to be able to intervene. And so he took out some marijuana, put it in an aluminum ashtray. He lit it and fanned it and got it smoking. Put it on a table and he had us walk by it so we could smell it. After about the eighth time around, <laughs> he caught on to us. But the things we do for our kids, right? It was after that, I mean, it was a situation where uh, I typed in youth suicide in, in, in my old computer in September after losing Jason. The stat that came up, suicide was the third leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 24 at that time. That's when the Jason Foundation started, when I saw that stat. Because I had gone to all those types of, of uh, programs and meetings, despite suicide being the third leading cause of death at that time, nobody had ever given a seminar on suicide awareness prevention or what to do if you should see those warning signs. So we started the Jason Foundation in October the 1st of 1997. And as we can say, Jason only represents what we can call a, a statistic of this silent epidemic of youth suicide. And why Jason is very scary and should be scary for you is the kind of young person that he was. Uh, if somebody would have asked me in June of 1997, what kind of young person would take his or her own life, I can grant you it would have not looked anything like my son. Not, even if I could have got a picture in my head, it would have not looked like my son. Jason was your all-American kid. And now let me define what all-American is. When I say all-American, he's not your valedictorian. He was like his good old dad. I was a solid BC student. I can remember my first day at Vanderbilt Graduate School. I walked in. I think I was there because they were trying to make some quota. <laughs> oh, I had never made. Uh, and they, they announced, by the way, you have to maintain a 3.0. I asked the person next to me, a 3.0, is that a solid B? They said, yes, I had never had a B average in my life. Uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of work to, to get through there. But Jason was that solid BC student. In fact, if he came home with an A in anything besides phys ed, I got suspicious. <laughs> uh, he was a, a good athlete, a natural athlete. A lot of friends, no drug or alcohol problems. He had the, he just turned 16, had his third hand-me-down car that he loved. Life was so promising. I hear that so many times now. I hear that week after week from a parent who's called us, who said everything was so promising, but I've just found my son, I just found my daughter. I've lost him to this terrible thing called youth suicide. So when we found that in September and started the Jason Foundation, we wanted to address the, this silent epidemic of youth suicide, and we decided just to do it in Tennessee at that time. Uh, we will talk more about that later. In the past 40 years, youth suicide rates have more than tripled while remaining relatively the same for most age groups until we just got the last report from the CDC. The last report from 1999 to 2014, suicide rates across all ages went up 24%. The fastest growing age group in our nation today, percentage-wise, guess, ages 10 to 14. 10 to 14 is the fastest, 37% increase since 1999 to 2014. Young people as a whole have experienced a higher rate of suicidal ideation and suicide than, it, than most other age groups that they look at. Uh, and middle age is also a high form, ash, uh, form there too. But today we're going to be looking at youth suicide and how it's affected. So remember, it's tripled in the last uh, uh, 40 years. I put this up because this, this is almost like a mentor. Uh, Dr. David Satcher, we started the Jason Foundation in 1997. 
uh, I met Dr. Satcher in 1999. He was the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General. He single-handedly has done more to advance youth suicide or suicide prevention across our nation than any individual that I've personally met before or since that date. Uh, he declared suicide across the board as a national public health issue. Now, why was this important? Suicide had been in the top 10 leading causes of death for four decades, four decades but had never been declared a public health issue until Dr. Satcher in 1999. In 2001, when we came out with a national strategy, he said suicide is epidemic, especially in the youth and the elderly. So we owe a lot of the work that we're here today for because of Dr. Satcher. I don't like to put up slides and just read them to you, so I want to just uh, encapsulate this. You can think of all natural causes and add them together. How many young people ages 10 to 24 that we lose to all natural causes and each year we'll lose more teenagers and young adults to suicide than all of those combined. All of those combined. Now what we hear about is influenza, AIDS, heart disease. We hear about the stroke and the pneumonia. We hear about all those different things and the cancers and we should hear about them. This is not de-emphasizing any of those. We should do everything that we could do to prevent any of those from, from harming or taking a young person's life in our nation today. We should put all the resources we have for it. But if you would know how little resources we are doing as a nation, as a nation to confront suicide, let alone just youth suicide, you would be appalled to know those numbers especially compared to these others that we're investing in. Now, I'm not saying we should take the money away from them. We should keep that money and invest it. But we have to do more as a nation to address this, this uh, terrible, silent epidemic of youth suicide. In the next couple of slides, you'll understand a little bit more of what I'm talking about here. How many young people do we lose in the United States each year? You know, a lot of times a smaller crowd I'll go around and ask, but I'm going to cheat for you today to save time. We're losing approximately 5,200, a little over 5,200 people every year to the silent epidemic of youth suicide. Now, we're talking about ages 10 to 24. Uh, we'll get more into that. Uh, when, remember when I said I looked at the computer, it was the third leading cause of death for 15 to 24. The CDC has changed their um, uh, looking as how they look at young people. Now it's 10 to 24. So that's the, when I'm talking. Uh, that's the age group that I'll be looking at. So in ages 10 to 24, we're losing over 5,200 young people each and every year uh, to this silent epidemic. And that's the verifiable ones. They don't allow for misreported suicides. What's a misreported suicide? I can tell you from my insurance background, single car accident on a beautiful afternoon, running straight into a bridge or a telephone pole, especially after a highly emotional time that they've had. No bad weather, no mechanical failures, just driving straight into that bridge. Uh, we've had one of the biggest ones out there is drug overdose. You realize you can have six to eight times the lethal dose of drugs in your body, and if you didn't tell somebody you did it intentionally or leave a note, many times that's written down as an accidental drug overdose. Even gunshots wounds. We've been on several that were gunshots to the head where the sheriff said, I'm writing it down as accidental because a note wasn't left and I want to spare the family. I want to spare those who knew him. 5,200 young people, the verifiable ones. If we included anything for misreported suicides, which some of the experts say is between 30 and 50% more, I tend to think that it might be, <coughs> excuse me, even higher than that. But let's break this down. That means each week in our nation, excuse me, each week in our nation, we're losing 100 young people. 100 young people, each a statistical average, each and every week to suicide. I like to, to sort of think of it this way. Think if we had a virus, let's call it virus A. Virus A was attacking young people ages 10 to 24. Didn't matter whether you were white, black, Asian, Latino. Didn't matter. Didn't matter whether you were rich or poor. Didn't matter whether you're from New York, California, Tennessee, or Kansas. But on every Friday night, the news anchor would get up and say, Virus A took 100 of our kids this week. Took 102, took 98. What do you think would be the number one subject for our de presidential debates, for our 
Senate or Congress, what would be the number one subject out there? It wouldn't be terrorism as much as we have to address it. It wouldn't be the budget as much as we need to address it. It would be, Mr. President, what do you tend to do about virus A before it takes my son, my daughter, my grandson, or my granddaughter? It's not a virus, but the results are the same. Today, each and every week, we'll lose 100 young people to this silent epidemic of youth suicide. And there's very, really little screaming going on about what to do to stop it. Today, suicide, and I'm gonna go through several age groups here, we look at 12 to 18. I wanted to include that because that really centers in on what we center in on as far as the middle and high school. Uh, and these are national numbers you're looking at here. Uh, our national numbers is that uh, suicide now in ages 12 to 18, the second leading cause of death in our nation today. If you have a young person and they're 12 to 18 years old, the second most likely thing to take their life is suicide. How many parents know that today? How many parents are aware of the threat that suicide poses to their family? Or when they do have a picture in their head, it looks nothing like their son or daughter but yet it's the second most likely thing in, their, in, in our nation to take their life. When we look at that age group for the CDC, ages 10 to 24, and that includes two, dip, two extra groups, our preteens, our 10 to 14, and then also it includes our college age youth. Suicide across the board there is the second leading cause. It was the third leading cause until two years ago. Two years ago, it went to the second leading cause. It used to be that the number one and this is the one we get on with the CDC and the people we talk with. The number one is a group. Most people think it's car accidents, it's not. Number one's a group, unintentional injuries. Included in that are car accidents, drownings, drug overdoses. Everything that's considered unintentional injury is put into that one. That's the only reason we have a number one today. It's not because they won't break that down into single items, it's a group. If it was not a group, suicide would be the number one leading cause of death in our nation today. And you don't want it the number one leading cause of death when we're not addressing it any more aggressively, in my opinion, than we are addressing it on a national basis uh, today. Second leading cause of death. Now, unintentional injuries. Used to be homicide was number two. Homicide has gone to number three now. Let's look at a couple of facts. Uh, girls attempt suicide at a rate three times more often than boys. Now, let's keep these next two or three slides in mind. They're attempting at three times more than boys. You see the thing about why? Well, we're going to cheat again. I'm not going to go around. I, I used to go around and do this, but for time we won't. I get responses like girls are more uh, in tune with their feelings. They're more responsive emotionally, more apt to respond or act on, on an impulse situation. We got a lot of, of, of feedback over the years on this, and probably there's some truth to every one of those, at least a bit of truth to this, but you want to know clinically why girls attempt at a rate three times higher than boys? We don't know. Don't know. If somebody can tell you they know, you need to run from them. We just clinically don't, but we know that's a fact they attempt at a rate three times higher than boys. However, boys complete suicide at a rate four times greater than girls. The reason for the difference? Choice of means. Choice of lethality. Up until recent times, girls have chosen drugs for the most part as, as their method of attempting suicide. Drugs many times will give you a window of opportunity, gives you a chance to intervene. If not minutes, hours, even as much as the next day, depends on the drug and the amount. Uh, boys have historically chosen firearms. Firearms gives you very few second chances, gives you very few chances to intervene. Because the choice of lethality now has caused that, that, that uh, misappropriation of, of deaths. Girls attempting at a rate three times higher than boys, but boys completing at the rate four times that of girls and because of choice of mean. Now let's keep those two slides together for a moment. How many young people are we losing per week? 100. 
girls are attempting four times higher than boys, and boys are complete, I mean girls three times, and boys are completing four times higher than girls, and that's equaling our rate at 100 per week. There's been called a recent trend. This trend really started in 2001, 2002. It's not all that recent. We're just now seeing the full impact of it. Girls, especially girls ages 10 to 19, have started changing the choice of lethality. Specifically, they've gone from drugs to suffocation, i.e. hanging, hanging. Two years ago, we had the largest single increase in youth suicide rates that we had in 15 years. It was all because of one age group, one gender, and one method. The age group was 10 to 19 year olds. The, the gender were girls, females, and, and the number one by far means was death by hanging, suffocation, <coughs> suffocation. This is starting to even increase those numbers. Now, what's going to happen when those girls, and please take this in the right way, when they were attempting at a rate three times higher than boys, and they were, they were attempting but not being successful because of the drugs, what happens when they, cho when they change their choice of lethality and start using a more lethal means? What's going to happen when they're attempting three times higher than boys? The rate is going to go up. And that's what we're experiencing in our nation today, the rate of suicide for young people going up. Even if we can keep all the other stats the same, just with that change in the choice of lethality, we're going to see a dramatic impact in the numbers just because girls who once were attempters are now becoming tragically the victims of suicide because of the choice of lethality. And we're still seeing that trend. In fact, we're seeing something that those of us in prevention can't understand. We, we don't, first of all, know why girls went from drugs to, to suffocation. But now we're seeing the trend that even boys, especially those boys in 10 to 19, are starting to change from firearms and going to suffocation also, hanging. Uh, it, firearms is still number one within the group, but that percentage is closing and closing rapidly. Uh, so just by the choice of lethality, we're seeing a large increase in youth suicides. But what about my state? You know, when we out talk, I get to be able to speak in a lot of good places. And usually when we use those national stats, the crowds are not too much different. They're going, gee, I didn't know that. Didn't know suicide was the second leading cause of death. I didn't know we were losing 100 young people per week for that. Gee, we got to do something that. We got to help those kids in California and New York and Tennessee. But I'm glad we don't have that issue here in my own home state. And it's what we hear many times. But let's look at Kansas specifically. I put all of these three together, but we'll look at it. Basically, what you can say is you can look at that age group 10 to 24, and you reflect the national stats perfectly. For 10 to 24, the second leading cause of death across the board for young people in Kansas. We're not talking about the kids in Tennessee anymore. Second leading cause here in your own state, the second most likely thing to take a young person's life ages 10 to 24 is suicide, only surpassed by that group, unintentional injuries. As you see also in the ages 12 to 18 and the 10 to 14. The 10 to 14, I was talking to some people before we started uh, this session. It scares me. I've been in this almost 19 years now. I understand the, the teens and the college kids, but we're getting now, uh, like I said, the, the fastest growing age group in America today is the 10 to 14 year olds. We've been brought in on three different eight-year-olds. Three different eight-year-olds. One who left his note to his daddy with a crayon. With a crayon. It is getting into our preteens, and it's so important the job you're doing, and we'll be talking about the Jason Flat Act, and it's so important about equipping our teachers uh, with that information, not making them counselors, and we'll talk more about that but to equip them with that information and know how to identify, stabilize, and then utilize you guys. Utilize the protocol that's there. Let's look at something. If you don't know about this, you might want to write this. It's called the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey. It's done by the Center for Disease Control, CDC. It's done every two years. The last one we have published is 2013. 2015 is supposed to be published this month. Uh, that's what the federal government's telling us. So we hope it gets out there. 2015 is finished, but it hadn't been published. So we'll be looking at the 2013 stats. 
Uh, you can go to the CDC, you look for Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, or just type in 2013 Youth Risk Behavioral Survey and it'll come up. A great tool if you work with kids like you guys do. It has about drug use, violence at school, carrying weapons. Anything that you can almost think about that would impact a young person's life is in that survey. And it's done usually with a state within their Department of Education, Department of Health, Mental Health, along with the CDC. Uh, and it's a very, very good report. There are four questions in that report that deals with suicide. And those are questions that we take very seriously at the Jason Foundation as we come into a state and start working. Because we can see where we can put our resources to make the most impact in a state. Because these questions are almost escalate in, into the finality of a suicide attempt. I wanna share those four questions with you very briefly. First question is, and, and you see in parentheses, that's the national norm. Now don't get excited if you're right at the national norm or you beat it a point or two, go woo, you know. Remember the national norm is second leading cause of death along with Kansas. Have you felt sad or hopeless every day in a row for a period of greater than two weeks so it affected your usual activity? What's that a question for? Depression, right. It can actually be considered the definition for what we consider the beginning of clinical depression. That thing that you just can't get up, hit yourself on the chin, get tough, get out there and overcome it yourself. A lot of times you gotta have help. Whether it's a counselor or counseling or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or even medication, it takes some time to get over that. Depression is the leading cause by far of suicides and suicide attempts in our nation today. Here in Kansas, 24% of your kids, almost one out of every four answer, they had felt that way, not in their lifetime, but in the past 12 months. They had felt that they had felt that they were sad or hopeless for a period of greater than two weeks. Could be identified at that point in the beginning stages, of depression or even clinical depression. The second question is, have you seriously considered suicide in the past 12 months? In Kansas, 16.4%, basically one out of every six kids in your state said that in the last year, they seriously considered taking his or her own life. Think about that. Even not just about your students, if you have kids at home, one out of every six kids in Kansas thought about that, seriously considered taking their life. Now, when we get to this slide, a lot of people that when we talk to and we're in some of the breakout sessions that we do sometimes, people say, well, Clark, are, you know, when we talk about serious, you're talking about an age group here of junior high and senior high kids. Really, Clark, how, how do they know something is that serious in life? You know, we start, we start wanting to qualify what seriousness is. And you know, in some degrees, there's some, there's some truth to that. What's very serious for a 12 and 13 year old, we look at sometimes not too serious. Uh, but we have to know we're looking at it through, through uh, years of experience where they're looking at it as what's happened in their life today. So we have to take, anytime a young person is seriously considering, we have to take that very serious ourselves. But that takes us to the third question. They understood this thing about uh, seriousness. The third question is, have you made a plan to commit suicide in the past 12 months? The reason this is important, and most of you know it because your counselors, you're out there. Uh, the part, if you're talking to someone, you're counseling with someone who you believe has suicidal ideation, doesn't matter what age group they're in. Uh, in that first initial counseling session, somewhere in that session, you're gonna ask them, have you thought about how you would do it? If they can tell you how, when, and where, You've done gone from a time of concern to a time of crisis. Because if something doesn't change that thought pattern, a suicide attempt is almost certain to happen with that individual. If they've prepared the who, what, when, and where. In Kansas, 12.5% of your kids, one out of every eight, got to the point in the past 12 months where they planned out, they planned out their own death by suicide. The when, the how, and the where. If that doesn't sober a parent up, let alone the counselors, the people dealing with our kids, but as a parent to think that one out of every eight kids in the state of Kansas actually got to the point of planning their own suicide. Of course, the last question, 
Have you attempted suicide one or more times in the past 12 months? In Kansas, 8.4%. One out of every 12, basically. One out of every 12 kids reported that he or she had attempted suicide in the past 12 months. Now again, sometimes we as adults, I run into adults who say, well, Clark, again, like the word seriousness, what do they mean by attempt? Well, there's one word that you can use here that, that you and I will not be friends. I'm, I'm a pretty friendly guy. I can get along, and even people with great differences, I can, I can discuss and debate passionately, but still love you to death, you my friend. But there's one term I can't, and it's used in this sometimes. They'll say, well, Clark, how many of those attempts were half-hearted suicide attempts? I cannot stand that term. I've seen professionals use that term. Half-hearted suicide attempt. I wish my son would have made a half-hearted suicide attempt. Any attempt or visualization by a young person that this is something that I'm doing to harm myself, we better start taking very seriously. I can't tell you the number of times across the country that our offices have been brought involved, especially within the school system, where we find out that, that there was a previous attempt already known about, but never gone beyond that teacher and that young person. Because an agreement had been made, if you don't tell anybody, I promise I won't do that again. And the reason we're there is because they did it again. They did it again. One out of every ki 12 kids in our state. Uh, this is one of the stats that we used when we were talking with the legislators and the, uh, Senator Smith, Senator Hawk, those that were very passionate, so many of them that came, came out. When they saw these, state, these stats that one out of every 12 young people in the state of Kansas had said on a, on a survey they had attempted suicide, that's something that you have to address uh, very aggressively. What I like to do is put those percentages into numbers. So what I did, I took those percentages and applied them to basically your school, your middle and high school people. Uh, and uh, the school population from, from uh, two, 2011 and 12 uh, to the 13. If nothing is done differently in the state of Kansas to affect those percentages, if things stay status quo, this is what you can expect for the next 12 months. You're going to have over 49,000 kids that if they were set down with a psychologist could be deemed in the beginning stages of depression or even starting clinical depression. Over 49,000. You're going to have 34,000 kids in the next 12 months that's going to seriously consider taking his or her own life. And out of that number, 26,000. 26,000 of your kids are going to make a plan. Remember, going time from a concern to a crisis, 26,000 students. And lastly, you're going to have 17,489 or an average of over 48 a day that will attempt suicide just in your state, just in your state over the next 12 months. Now remember, these are not the Jason Foundation numbers. Uh, these are the Center for Disease Control, your own Department of Education, and your own kids that put these numbers together. But what can be done? Gosh, Clark, we were having a good time. This was a great cup. And you, you, you done brought in and said the second leading cause of death. I'm not only worried about my students, but I've got sons. I've got daughters. I've got grandsons and granddaughters. Good grief. I didn't know that. What can be done? Because suicide is so impulsive. What can we do to prevent it? You know, this is one of the greatest myths that is out there today. One of the greatest myths. And it's a myth we want to hold on to as society. Not so much counsel, but society. We want to hold on to this myth. Why? Because when we hear about that young person who took his or her own life in our community, or that student, when we hear about that, we say it's a tragedy. What a sad thing. But we say, in our own hearts at least, there's nothing we could do about it. You see, there was a breakup with a boyfriend or girlfriend. They, did, they failed a test. They got grounded. Uh, they didn't get into the college that their granddad and their dad and mom got into. They all these reasons, and that's why that young person took his or her own life. And it was so impulsive, we can't be with them 24-7, Clark. But it's sad, but we can't do anything about it. We like to believe that because it takes the responsibility away from us as a society. It takes that responsibility that we might could have done something. We might could have made a difference. 
Let's look at how we can do that. First of all, this is a stat that keeps me going. It's a, it's a national survey that's been done two different times, came out with the same stat. Four out of five young people who will attempt suicide will demonstrate clear warning signs before the attempt. Think about that. Not that we have to do research, not that we have to find more information, not that we have to find that, 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 that wonder drug. Four out of five young people who will attempt suicide in the coming 12 months will demonstrate clear warning signs before the attempt. And we're not just talking about minutes before or hours, most of the time days, even weeks, even months. They'll demonstrate some very clear warning signs. People have asked me about Jason. I can go back now because I'm a little more learned about the situation. He started showing warning signs as early as January before we lost him in July. In fact, there were some warning signs that I'm embarrassed that I missed as a, as a counselor, as someone with some training in the background as late as June. But I wasn't putting warning signs together. I wasn't putting the information together in the correct way to, to see that this was a real danger to my son's life. Four out of five will demonstrate those warning signs. That means in 80% of the attempts, or even more importantly, 80% of those young people who die by suicide, we can make a difference. If we know what to look for, if we know what the warning signs are, if we know what to look for and how to responsibly respond to those, 80% of the time we have a chance to intervene. Now 20% can be that impulsive uh, suicide. There are those types of suicides out there where everything's been going great, but on a certain day something very bad happens and, and then a person chooses that as the way out. So that's the one out of five. And what we're gonna do at the Jason, we're gonna go after the easy ones first, the four out of five. Four out of five, we can stop those. If we can educate the, the young people, the teachers, the educators, and the parents, the communities. If we can do that, then 80% of those, we have a chance to intervene and make a difference in those lives. What can be done? Very quickly, we're gonna go through three of these. Our training, which some of you will be seeing, hopefully, in the coming year. Our trainings are going anywhere from just the training for, from an hour to two hours. Uh, so I'm hitting this very quickly because I had an hour for all, but I wanted to expose you to this part at least. What can be done? Increase awareness, dispel myths, and of course, education. Let's look at the first one, increasing awareness. That's the simple one. That's doing things like we're doing here today. That's doing the awareness of not making people scared, and that's awfully important. I don't try to come out and scare people when we talk or we do our seminars. We're trying to educate you. We're trying to, to, to bring up the, the fact that how many people, think about it, if they didn't know that you had a suicide prevention program this morning, Go back in a couple of weeks. Go to your church. Go to the community. Ask somebody along the way. Say, by the way, what do you think the top five leading causes of death are for our young people today here in Kansas? Do you think many of them would name suicide as one of those top, let alone number two? Number two, awareness is the foundation for prevention. If you don't have the awareness, if you don't have the concern, you're not looking for it. That's why we're, I was so proud we have the news media here. We've had the newspaper, we've had people. That's so important. Not only can we go out, think, well, I think we had 350 people that were registered. You guys go out and tell 10 people each. Think of what, we, what we've done. Think of the numbers that we've touched. When the media says something, says, look, look what these people, the counselors have come together to learn about this. Did we know that it was the second leading cause of death? The people that will be reached. Just by raising the awareness, just by raising the awareness, we can make the first step for, for the foundation prevention. Dispelling myths, that's number two. I want you to know we started the Jason Foundation in 1997 in October. Oh, the myths that were out there then. Some of you might have been in the work at that point too. Oh me, uh, talking to someone about suicide will put the idea in their head. Oh, you've ever heard that one? Thank God that we don't hear that as much today as I heard in 1999 and 2000 and 2001. I was called to a school in Southern uh, Tennessee, right on the border, I won't name the county. Uh, we were called down there to help. They had had three suicides in one school year. 
three. I was sitting there in front of the principal, and he said, Mr. Flat, I'm glad you came down, and I'm glad you shared some things with our counselors, but we're not going any further. We're not going to talk to the students. We're not going to talk to the teachers. not going to talk to the parents. He said, because you see, if we talk to them, we'll put the idea in their head. I'll never forget him saying that. I said, sir, the, the idea is in their head. You've lost three students in a nine-month period. Talking to someone about suicide doesn't put the idea in their head. It's almost like the teen pregnancy, seeing the results of it will make you want to think about sex. That that's just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. Actually, it's been proven the other way. Talking about suicide in a professional, structured manner can only do positive things. Should someone be struggling with those, it gives them permission then to be able to know it's okay to talk to you about it. And someone who talks about killing themselves not at risk, Boy, uh, if, if, if someone's told you that they're thinking about killing themselves, take it serious. I can't tell you how many teachers, especially, that we've talked with over the years as we come in on a post mention, and I don't like that at all. We're prevention, but we will come in and help on the tell if we have to. Uh, but they'll say, well, they said they were going to do this, and, and I didn't believe them. I want you to know you want to start believing. First of all, it's the right thing to do. Second of all, it's the legal thing to do. Lawsuits are up tenfold right now for teachers, tenfold uh, over what it was in 2000. Suicide is impulsive. There's nothing we can do to prevent it. We've already talked about that. Four out of five will show warning signs before the attempt. Education, there's two parts, warning signs, what I like to call signs of concern. When you look at the Jason uh, materials, you'll see most, they will have warning signs, but we'll say signs of concern. I got that from Dr. David Satcher. You know, and I believe what he said, when you see warning sign, if this is a warning sign, when you see this, this is probably more than likely gonna 100% time happen. Well, that's not the way it is on these things. A lot of the warning signs for suicidal ideation can be some of the same signs of uh, adolescence. What we have to do is learn to look for them in uh, severity. We have to look for them in, in how they are coming together at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of different things we can look for there. But they are signs of concern because when you see them, it doesn't necessarily mean a suicide attempt is going to happen, but it can if something is not intervened and something happens. And of course, elevated risk factors we're just going to barely touch on. Signs of concern, and we're going to talk about the five major ones. These are the ones when we said four out of five young people will demonstrate warning signs. They're talking about it'll be these. It'll be these. Suicide threats. It can be as obvious as someone saying, I'm going to kill myself. You'll be amazed, or maybe you as a counselor wouldn't be that. We find that, that the general public many times are, are amazed that somebody will actually say, I'm going to kill myself. And it happens so many, many times. It can be a little less obvious, though, as someone saying, you know, have you ever heard a young person say, nobody would miss me if I wasn't here? Nobody really loves me. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter whether I wake up tomorrow morning. All of those are in their own way suicide threats. If you ever hear a student talking like that, or your son or daughter, stop whatever you're doing and say, did you just say something about you're thinking about dying? I have talked to literally hundreds of young people, hundreds, over the last 18 plus years who have attempted suicide. You'd be amazed how many of them said, you know, I let my friends, I let my family, I let those people closest to me know that I was considering killing myself and nobody asked me, are you thinking about hurting yourself? And by not asking me, that verified my, my conclusion, nobody cared. When you hear that, reach out to that student. Let them know that yeah, they're probably going to say, oh, no, I was just using that as an expression. Tell them how glad that it's just an expression and how the world would be so much at a loss if it wasn't for him or her being there. Because even though they might not have been serious at that time, if they come to that point where they are serious and they remember your conversation, what are they going to remember? That you just ignored it or that you said, wait a minute, no, don't be thinking that way. You're important to me, you're important to our school, you're important to our community. Previous suicide attempts, that's a hard one to come to. Uh, and, and those that, that we talk to who are experts uh, think that this could be as high as 30 to 50% more than the suicide that we, that we have reported. Uh, that 
a previous suicide attempt. What gets me on this one is someone has already attempted suicide one time, and we're hearing about it now because it's a completed suicide. So they've completed numerous times they, they've attempted suicide. A previous suicide attempt, and I'll tell you, this is great for you as counselors, and share this with your teachers, please. If you've made one of those packs with a student, okay, we know about this. And they say, oh, I was having a bad day. You, you don't know this, this, I wasn't serious. I wasn't serious. And please don't tell my mom and dad. Please don't tell, they're gonna overreact. They're gonna take my car. Please, I won't ever do this again. And, and you've made that agreement with them. You leave here. You have my permission to leave right now. And you go and you get on the phone and you call that person's parents and say, I need to share something with you. Your son or daughter attempted suicide. Attempted suicide. We need to get them help. That is probably one of the biggest ones we run into that is a big problem. And let me tell you, we, we talked the legal side before. That's now starting. And prior to 2003 and 4, we, we barely saw e any legal action. Why? Because court systems would look at teachers and say, that doesn't fall under the duty, legal definition, of teacher. And they throw it out. That's not happening now. More and more, it's being considered part of the duty of a teacher to be able to not treat, not counsel, but be able to identify and be able to respond. Depression's a hard one. Some people who are depressed eat everything that, that doesn't get out of their reach. Uh, some people depressed don't eat at all. Some people sleep all the time, they don't sleep. We like to tie it to number four, out of character behavior. If a young person is acting different, out of character, very loud, becomes very quiet, very quiet, becomes very loud. Someone who's always outgoing becomes very reserved. Very reserved person becomes very outgoing. Uh, any major out of character behavior, does it mean that they're suicidal? No. But it does mean there's something going on in that young person's life. And if it's not addressed, if it's left unaddressed, untreated, then along with some other events and a trigger event, you can very well have a suicidal ideation there. And then final arrangements is giving away prized possessions. Uh, it used to be that only girls did this, uh, or majority of it was girls. They would give away a prized possession before us do it. Boys now are doing it more and more. Uh, so we always tell, especially when we're talking with the young people, if your friend's giving you a great gift, you know how prized possession it is for that friend, make sure you ask that friend, why are you giving it to me now? Why, you know, this is wonderful, but why are you giving it? As I told you, those hundreds that I talked to, you'd be amazed the number of them say, I gave my best friend my prized possession, and they never asked me why. You know, if, if you're a parent and your son or daughter comes home with a prized possession, say, boy, your friend must really care about you to give you that. Did you ask him when? Did you ask him why he's giving it to you? And if he can't tell you or she can't tell you, tell him to get on the phone, call your friend, thank them again, thank them again, and then ask them why they're giving it to them. You'd be amazed at the student saying, I'm waiting for somebody to ask me why. And it's, I'm going to tell them because I'm not going to be here much longer. It can save a person's life. We know where that one question has saved many young people's life. So final arrangements. Elevated risk, we are not because of time going into, into these, uh, but you can see these, these aren't some of our training materials. It's the things where most people who think of suicide think of only kids in these risk groups. While it's true within these risk groups, the suicidal ideation is elevated above the, the national norms they still do not represent the number one young person that we lose in the nation to suicide. Our elevated risk factors, perfectionists, bullying, gay and lesbian community, the learning disabled, students in trouble, abusers of drugs or alcohol. I wish we had time to go into all of those. Those are elevated. If there's a young person you know that's, first of all, in between the ages of 10 to 24, and they have any of these factors also, you've gone from just a, a general high risk that it is anyway, the second leading cause of death, to where you've elevated that risk group. But please remember that the number one young person we're losing today does not neatly fit into any one of these categories. 
Our young person who we're losing today is that all-American kid. Usually that person who's excelling in school, that person who's the football captain or the cheerleading captain or the chess team president or the student body leader, the young person that seems to look like they have everything going for them, that's the young person that we're losing today to suicide across our nation. What will you do when that moment might come to you? Very quickly, and, and this is something we'll know more, is, is just be able to, first of all, ask the question. That's a hard, I've been doing this for 18 years, and we're brought in sometimes, where you have to ask the question, are you thinking about killing yourself? Tough question. Why is it tough? What if that young person says yes? You've just put your life in my hands. That's a tough question, but it's a question we have to ask. Learn the emergency protocol. I was talking to some, some of you guys yesterday afternoon. One of the things that you'll see with the Jason Flat Act coming up, not only being able to identify, but having a school. Thank goodness most schools now have a protocol set up for someone who's having emotional or especially suicidal risk. What the protocol, who to call. You don't want to be deciding at that time what's, what your protocol is. You need to have that set protocol. If you don't, you need to go back. You need to have a discussion with your principals and say, we need to put a set protocol. Who's our resources in our community? How do we contact the first people, the parents? How do we get this going? Have that protocol and have it before you have that situation. Very important. Basic rule to remember is if you ever have a doubt, always get a professional involved. You're a professional, but go to that next level also. Get those people involved that can help you. Remember those 100 young people who die each week? This is why I'm in Manhattan, Kansas today and not back at my home playing with that suspicious cat that I have. 80 of those young people that will die this week shouldn't have died. Think about that. They showed their friends, their teachers, their pastors, their parents, their grandparents. They demonstrated clear warning signs, and we missed it or underreacted to it. 80 of those kids shouldn't have died this week, and that's the ones that we have to start working hard to say, then we're going after those 20. Then we're going after the 20. Very quickly about the Jason Foundation, and I've got to go a little quicker uh, because the end part I really want you to see, and this is not that important. You'll learn more about us over the year, hopefully. Jason Foundation, we're headquartered in Hendersonville, Tennessee. That's right outside of Nashville. Uh, we're one of the larger youth suicide prevention programs in the nation. We have 93 offices across the country. Uh, and we, as I say, we, we work in all 50 states. We actually have offices in 36 states. Uh, and so, uh, and we provide educational programs. We do not do counseling. Uh, we provide the programs to help identify and, and know how to refer. That's a picture of my buddy Jason. That was taken about three months before I, we lost him. And uh, our theme is keeping more than young uh, dreams alive. And we do it one young person at a time. We provide programs for the young people for the teachers, youth workers, and for the parents. And again, let me stress, our programs are not set up to make, especially teachers that you'll be hearing about, we're not making them counselors. And you'll hear in each one of those things, you're not a counselor. We're not making your account. What we want to do is equip you with the information, tools, and resources to help you identify warning signs and know how to stabilize and then know how to work within the protocol of your school or your community to get that young person help. Very important. There are some organizations out there who work to try to train people, in my opinion, to make them counselors after uh, two or three hours. That's dangerous. In my opinion, very, very dangerous. In suicide, you only make one mistake. I've been doing this for 18 plus years. Uh, have a background in, in counseling. I would not try to counsel one-on-one -on -one a suicidal team. I would bring in those people who are the experts and can help. I'll be part of the team, I'll be part of the team, but I wouldn't do the counseling. This is my commercial. Uh, we, at the Jason Foundation, you hear more. Since 1997, we have never charged for any one of our programs or the support for that program. That was easy in 1997. We had about 200 and 225 people that we were working with. Last year, we provided services for 1.8 million people uh, across the United States and we didn't charge a single, single person or school or school district or state that I had contracts with the state. 
Uh, these are the reasons why, mostly. Uh, we have national community partners, uh, Cadia Healthcare, HCA, Springstone, Signature, uh, the AFCA, that's how Bill Snyder got involved. We've worked with AFCA. We work with over 87 of the leading coaches in the nation today. They help us with our PSAs. They help us getting into the right places. They helped us here in Kansas when we were trying to do the, the Jason Flat Act. Uh, I was talking to Senator Hawk. He said, you're the one that sicked Bill Snyder on me, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. I was him. And Coach Snyder calling the legislators and saying, you got to pass this. Yeah, our AFCA coaches are fantastic. Uh, we work with AFL, uh, our attorney general program. General Smith has been a big supporter of us. In fact, the reason we have the Jason Flat Act here in Kansas was General Smith came to me and said, would you think about bringing it to Kansas? You were not on my list of the next five states to do. I hate to, it wasn't there. It wasn't on my list. Because of General Smith, we made the exception, brought Kansas in, took another one out of that five. So uh, you owe General Smith that, that leadership of bringing us here to talk. Our school-based program, I'm hitting these very quickly. Please go to our website and learn more. It's, it is a student program. It is not an after school. It's not a peer support program. It, it fits just like the teen pregnancy program. It is a three to five classroom presentation and it's, fit, it's set to fit within the health and wellness curriculum of a school. Uh, it's there in a third person. You're learning how to help a friend. We do that purposely. We don't want introspection. We're wanting you to learn how you can recognize and help a friend. When I lost Jason, he called two friends the morning that he killed himself, told both of those friends what he was going to do, when he was going to do it, and how he was going to do it. Neither one of those friends called anyone. It wasn't because they're bad kids. They froze. They didn't know what to do. One of them told the police, I was afraid if I called, I would get him in trouble. You know, we have to get our young people to know. They see the changes in their friends way before anybody else. Again, not make them counselors, but help them know to come to you. A friend asked, please, very quickly, it's a smartphone app, probably one of our best things. Download it for free on your iPhone. Go to the Jason Foundation. Uh, iPhone uh, or Android, it talks about all the warning. You can have it in your, in your phone, the warning signs, elevated risk factors, the do's and don'ts, all those things. We made it for, for young people, but now we have probably more teachers and, and people working with youth than anybody else using it. You'll see the Get Help Now button. If you push that, you're connected to the, most, the, the closest certified uh, national talk line that specializes in suicidal prevention uh, that's in here and it's free, you can call, you can say, I'm trying to help a student. I need some resources, I need some things, and they'll help you out. A great app. Our staff development, that's our teacher in service. You'll be learning more about that. Uh, it's, it's uh, we do probably, we, I know, we do more teachers than anybody in the nation. Last year, we trained 154,000 plus teachers, tested them and, and, and gave them the certificate of completion uh, in, in one year. Uh, the Jason Flat Act, I'm supposed to be due in three minutes. Can, can I have five more minutes? Thank you. Hey, you keep these people happier. They don't invite you back. I'm sorry, but I'm running a little late. I, you guys didn't excite me a little too much. The Jason Flat Act was first passed in Tennessee, my home state, in 2007. It, when it was passed, it became the most aggressive, comprehensive training requirement for teachers in the nation. It required 84,000 teachers to have two hours of suicide prevention training every year or not be certified to teach in the state of Tennessee. Every year. It didn't have to be ours. It could be anyone approved by the Department of Education. It was passed 2007, became mandated in 2008. The next three years, youth suicide rates in Tennessee went down 28.4%. Arming our teachers with information, tools, and resources, not to make them counselors, but to be able to better identify and then work within their school's protocol. And if the school doesn't have a protocol, create that protocol, saves lives. There's no doubt in my mind about it. In fact, I believe equipping the teachers and school personnel with this is the single most impactful thing a state can do to address youth suicide in our state. Not the only thing now but the single most impactful thing a state can do. 
We're proud now, as uh, we were discussed at the beginning, we have 19 states that have passed it in total today. Kansas was number 19. In fact, I leave here today to go to the Capitol. Uh, Senator Brownback, I mean, Senator, made him a Senator. Uh, Governor Brownback is doing the ceremonial signing this afternoon at 2 o'clock on the Jason Flat Act of Kansas uh, in honor of uh, Katie Hausch uh, in memory of her. Uh, a family that lost their daughter here. Uh, it is so important for Kansas. It's something we did because they do it as Jason Flat Act. It was passed without a fiscal note. The Jason Foundation has told all 19 states, if you pass it within the parameters that we have set forward, we will guarantee it can be done without a fiscal note. And it's been done in every state except California. Uh, which they cannot pass anything without a, it's, it's a law. You've got to have a, 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 an appro appropriation for it. So they, I don't know what they did with the money. We're not getting it, but they appropriated some. All the other ones have done it without a fiscal note. And we're proud Kansas did. We're signing it, ceremonial today. Uh, I was able to talk to Dr. Watson uh, yesterday. He was excited. He was a big reason we got it passed. I want you to know, he worked hard. He worked hard to get this passed. So we're appreciative of that. That's where we're passed in right now. We're in 19 states. We expect to have five to seven more states uh, next year. Uh, B1 program, please just go on to learn more about that. It's Rascal Flats, no kin, uh, but a very positive peer support. A lot of schools do this as a positive way to get their students involved. And please learn more about that on our, our website. In our parent community one, it's done by DVD, uh, it's taught by that. All you need to do is have a facilitator. A lot of PTOs and PTAs use this to do a general awareness to the parents about youth suicide. Very good program. To find an affiliate office, go to our website, do about us, and go down and find uh, locations. And you can find the closest one to you. We invite you to go there. You find us on Facebook. Again, I had to hire somebody to do Facebook at our office. <laughs> I can read it, but that's about all I can do. If you haven't done it, please, it'll make my director so happy if you'll go sometime and sign on to the, the face. Be one of our friends. We have over 10,000 uh, right now, and it's growing. We'd love for you to be on there and share with us. Our website's jasonfoundation.com, and I invite you to, to go and learn a lot more about us there. I end with this. It's three and a half minutes. I'm going to make you late. I'm sorry. This is the most important part of the whole program, in my opinion. The worst thing you see you could leave here today with is what we call not my kid syndrome, where you've learned all of this and you said, Clark, we gotta do stuff. We gotta work in our schools. We gotta work in our churches. We gotta work in our communities. We can't let this continue to take our young people's lives. We gotta work hard. But I'm so glad I don't have to worry about my son or daughter. You see, my son, my daughter, they're the, the head of the cheerleading squad, the captain of the football team. They're an academic, all-American. They're, they're being recruited by so many schools and colleges. They're just good all-around kids. No drug or alcohol problems. I'm so glad I don't have to worry about my kid. I've just described, as I said, the number one young person that we're losing in America today to suicide. The worst thing you could leave here today, the worst thing I could do to you, is you leave here with a not my kid syndrome. Won't happen there. Please take that same passion that you would have for your students and make sure you do it for your own families. This is called Faces to Statistics. It's three and a half minutes long. Every face you will see here is a young person that we've, been, that we've lost to youth suicide. We don't do this to be emotional or pull a high emotional ring out of you or pass a plate. These parents gave me their sons and daughters for one reason that you would see a face that looks like your son, your daughter, your grandson, or your granddaughter are one of the kids you work with. And if you said suicide took that young person, it's a threat to me, and I'm not going to let it happen. It's called One More Day. It's three and a half minutes, and I'll be through.
there's not any amount of money I can raise, any law that I can pass that will save or give one more day to any one of these kids. Can't do it. I would give everything I ever made, everything I would ever make on the face of this earth to have one more day with Jason. Can't do it. But there's other Jasons, Tito's, and Angela's that are out there in your community today, that are out there in Kansas today, that by working together, by working and in, 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 in working together in collaboration, that we can give one more day to, and another day and another day. Thank you so much for letting me come and share. Thank you for being on the front line. I apologize for running over, but thank you guys. It's my honor to talk to you. Keep doing what you're doing, and together we'll work together to save lives. Thank you for letting me come.